If I didn't manage to find the insect, she couldn't sleep. I could feel her body trembling at the least rustling sound. There, in the deathly silence of night, I could hear her holding her breath and whispering, It's by the door. It's crawled under the chest. Why are you so frightened of cockroaches, I said. This made her reply sharply. I can't understand what use they are, for the life of me. They do nothing but crawl about, and they're all black. God gave the lowest creature some appointed task. The wood louse shows the house is damp. A bed bug means the walls are dirty. A louse means that someone's going to become ill. It all makes sense. But these things, who knows what evil power lives in them or what they're here for. Once, when she was kneeling, having one of her heart-to-hearts with God, Grandfather flung open the door and said hoarsely, God's really come to see us this time. We're on fire. What are you talking about? Grandmother cried, jumping to her feet. With heavy stamping, they both rushed into the darkness of the front parlor. Yevgenia, take the icons out. Natalia, get the children dressed. Grandmother gave these commands in a firm, stern voice, while Grandfather softly howled to himself. I ran out to the kitchen. The window overlooking the yard shone as if it had been turned to gold. Yellow patches of light flickered and drifted over the snow. Uncle Yakov, in bare feet, was trying to put his shoes on. He jumped on them just as if the soles were alight and shouted, It's Mishka's work. He set us alight and left us to it. Quiet, you dog, said Grandmother as she pushed him towards the door so hard he nearly fell over. Through the frost on the windows, the workshop roof could be seen burning. Inside its open door there was an inferno of curling flames. Its fiery red flowers blossomed without any smoke in the quietness of the night. Only a darkish cloud hung in the air without obscuring the silver, the silver flow of the Milky Way. The snow gleamed purple and the walls of the outhouses shuddered as, they had been, as though they were trying to reach the corner of the yard where the fire was blazing merrily. Lighting up the broad gaps in the workshop walls and thrusting twisted flames through them like red-hot nails. Red and golden ribbons of fire swiftly ran along the dry planks of the roof and coiled round them. The thin clay smoking chimney stuck out of the middle. A soft crackle and silky rustle could be heard at the window. The fire grew bigger and bigger, and the workshop now, looking beautiful in the fire, resembled the iconostasis in a church, and lured one on irresistibly. I threw a heavy sheepskin coat over my head, shoved my feet into someone else's boots, and dragged myself out into the passage, and then on the front steps where I stood, stock still, blinded by the fierce light of the dancing flames, deafened by the shouts of Grandfather, Grigory, and my uncle, and the crashing noise from the fire, and frightened out of my wits by the way Grandmother carried on, with an empty sack thrown over her head and with a horse blanket round her, she ran straight into the fire and shouted, The vitriol, you idiots! The vitriol will explode! Gregory, stop her, howled Grandfather. She'll never get out of there alive. But Grandmother, her hand shaking, and the smoke coming from her clothes had already emerged, bent under the weight of a flagon of oil, which she held in her outstretched hands. Father, get the horse out, she said, with a wheezing cough and take this thing off my shoulders. Can't you see I'm on fire? Grigory snatched the smoldering blanket from her shoulders and, stooping low, began furiously shoveling huge lumps of snow at the workshop door. Near him, my uncle jumped about with a chopper in his hands. Grandfather ran round, grandmother hurling snow. Grandfather ran round, grandmother hurling snow at her. She threw the flagon into the snowdrift and rushed to the main gates, opened them, and said as she ran to meet the neighbors who came pouring in, Save the barn! If the fire spreads to the barn and the hayloft, everything will go up your own houses as well. Cut the roof down and throw the hay into the garden. Gregory, throw snow upwards. What's the use of chucking it on the ground? Yakov, stop fussing and give these people spades and choppers. Dear neighbors, all work together and God will help us. She fascinated me as much as the fire, lit up by it and appearing to be enveloped by the flames. She dashed around the yard, a figure in black turning up everywhere at once, giving orders to everyone. Sheriff ran out into the courtyard, reared up and knocked my grandfather over. The fire was reflected in his gleaming eyes. The horse snorted and jibbed. Grandfather let go of the halter and leapt to one side. He shouted, Hold him, mother! She threw herself under the feet of the rearing horse and stood in front of him, looking like a cross, with her arms outstretched. The horse gave a mournful neigh and craned its neck, its neck towards her, squinting from the fierce light. Now don't be frightened, Grandmother mother said in a deep voice as she patted its neck and took the halter. Do you think I'd leave you in this, you little mouse? The little mouse, three times her size, followed her meekly to the gates and snorted as it peered into, the flushed, into her flushed face. Evgenia brought the children out of the house, all wrapped up in blankets and wailing. Vasily, I can't find Alexei, she cried. Come on, get out of here, Grandfather answered, shaking his hand. 
I hid under the porch steps so Yevgenia couldn't take me as well. The workshop roof had already collapsed. Thin smoking rafter beams stuck out from against the sky and glowed like golden red hot coals. Inside the building, green, blue, and red whirlwinds roared and crackled as they exploded. The flames surged out into the yard in broad ribbons of fire, flung themselves at the crowd of people standing in front of the great conflagration and shoveling snow onto it. The vats boiled furiously in the fire, and steam and smoke rose from them in a thick cloud. Strange smells wafted round the yard, making the eyes water. I climbed out from under the steps and stumbled right into my grandmother's legs. Get out of here, she cried. You'll get crushed to death. A horse rider wearing a brass helmet rode into the yard. His rust-colored horse was foaming at the mouth. He carried a whip in his hand, and he lifted it high, shouting in a menacing voice. Make way! The bells rang out merrily, rapidly, and everything seemed bright and festive to me. Grandmother pushed me onto the steps. Can't you hear? Get out of here! This time I had to obey her. I went into the kitchen and pressed my face to the window again, but could see no trace of the fire through the dark mass of people only brass helmets among the black winter hats and peaked caps. The fire was swiftly trampled to the ground and put out with water. The police dispersed the crowd and grandmother came into the kitchen. Who's that? Oh, you. Too frightened to sleep? Don't be afraid, it's all over. She sat by me, gently rocking from side to side. The quiet night and darkness had returned once more, and I felt pleased. But I was sorry about the fire. Grandfather came in, stood by the door, and asked, Mother? What? Did you get burnt? No. She stuck a sulfur match in its blue flame, lit up. His polecat face all dirty with soot. He found, him, he found a place for the candle on the table and slowly seated himself beside Grandmother. You'd better have a wash, she said, covered in soot herself and smelling acrid from the smoke. Grandfather sighed. God's been kind to you. He's given you a lot of common sense. He stroked her shoulder and added, showing his teeth and a broad smile. He only lets you have it for a short while, though, about an hour at a time. We'll have to get rid of Gregory. He's to blame. There's no more work, f work in him. He's finished. There's Yashka sitting on the steps crying, the little fool. You better go to him. She got up and walked away, holding her hand in front of her face and blowing on her fingers without looking at me. Grandfather asked, did you see it all did you see it all from the beginning? What do you think of your grandmother now? An old woman, broken down and worn out, yet you saw what she could do. As for the rest of them. He bent down and said nothing for a long time. And then he stood up, snuffed the candle with his fingers, and asked me again, Were you afraid? No. Of course there really was nothing to be afraid of. He angrily stripped his shirt off and went over to the wash basin in the corner. There in the darkness he stamped and shouted, Fancy having a fire. Anyone who loses everything he has in a fire should be flogged publicly in the square. He's either a fool or a thief. If people followed my advice, there wouldn't be any fires. Off to bed with you now. What are you sitting there like that for? I went away to my room, but that night I couldn't sleep. I had just lain down when an unearthly howling made me spring out of bed. I ran into the kitchen again, and there in the middle stood Grandfather, shirtless and holding a candle which trembled in his hands. Without moving, he scraped his feet over the floor and said in a wheezing voice, Mother, Yakov, what's that? I jumped up over the stove and hid in the corner. The place was filled up with the same uproar as when the fire had started. The painful howling grew louder and louder and broke in regular waves against the ceiling. Grandfather and uncle ran around as if they had gone out of their minds. Grandmother shouted to them to go away. With a heavy crashing sound, with a heavy crashing, with, with a heavy crashing sound, Gregory crammed some woods into the stove and poured water into some cast iron pots and walked around the kitchen nodding his head like a camel from Ascrahan. First get the stove going, ordered Grandmother. Grigory hastily began searching for kindling on top of the on top of the stove. He brushed against my foot and cried out in a worried voice. Who's there? Oh, you gave me a fright. You seem to be everywhere you're not supposed to be. What's going on? And Natalia's in labor, he said in an indifferent voice, as he jumped down onto the floor. I remembered that Mother didn't shout like that when she had a baby. Gregory put the iron pots in a corner and climbed up to where I was on the edge above the stove, took a clay pipe out of his pocket and showed it to me. I started smoking. It's for my eyes. Grandmother told me to take snuff, but I think I'm better off smoking. He sat on one side of the stove, his legs dangling, and looked down at the, feeb down at the feeble flame of the candle. 
One of his ears and, and his cheek were smeared with soot, and his shirt was torn on one side. I could see his ribs through the tear. They were broad like barrel hoops. One of the lenses of his dark glasses was broken, and half of it hung out of the frame, revealing in the gaping hole it left a red, moist eye just like a wound. He filled his pipe with leaf tobacco, listened to the pregnant woman's groans, and muttered incoherently to himself like a drunkard. Grandmother got burnt all the same. How will she be able to deliver the baby now? Just listen to her groaning out there. They forgot about her in the excitement. The pains came on right at the beginning of the fire. The fright started her off. Men don't realize what women have to go through when they have a baby, and they've no respect for them. Remember, respect the weaker sex. Mothers, I mean. I dozed off, but was soon woken up by a terrible din of doors being slammed and the drunken shouts of Uncle Mikhail. Strange words came to my ears. Open the altar doors, give her some lamp oil mixed with rum and soot, half a glass of oil, half of rum, and a spoonful of soot. Uncle Mikhail kept on nagging. Let me have a look at her. He sat on the floor, his legs wide apart. He kept spitting on the floor in front of him and hitting it with the palms of his hands. It became unbearably hot over the stove, and I climbed down. When I came level with my uncle, however, he caught me by the leg and pulled me, making me fall and hit the back of my neck. Idiot, I said to him. He jumped to his feet and swung me in the air, bellowing like a wild beast. I'll smash you on the stove. I came to in a corner of the room, near the icons. Grandfather had me on his knees, and he rocked me and muttered, None of us will be forgiven. No one. An icon lamp burned brightly above his head, and a candle burnt on the table in the middle of the room. The dull window, winter morning was already looking in through the window. Grandfather leant over and asked me, Where does it hurt? Everything hurt. My head felt wet and my body was heavy, but I didn't want to tell him, as everything around me seemed so strange. People I had never seen before were sitting on nearly every chair in the room. A priest dressed in purple, dressed in purple a gray-haired old man in military uniform who wore glasses, and many more, and many more. They all sat motionless like pieces of wood, frozen in, in expectation, as they listened to water splashing somewhere quite near. Uncle Yakov stood by the door jamb, stiff and erect, with his hands hidden behind his back. Grandfather said to him, Take him off to bed. Uncle beckoned to me, and we tiptoed to Grandmother's room. When I climbed into bed, he whispered, Aunt Natalia's dead. This didn't surprise me. For some time now, she had cut herself off from everybody else in the house and never came into the kitchen or ate with us at the table. And where's grandmother? There, Uncle answered, waving his hand and tiptoeing off in his, bare, in his bare feet. I lay in bed and looked around. Blind, gray, hairy faces pressed against the window panes. In one corner over the chest hung grandmother's dress. I knew this very well, but now it seemed that something alive was there, waiting. I hid my head under the pillow and peeped out the door. I felt like jumping out of the feather bed and running away. It was stuffy and the room was full of an, of an oppressive, rank smell, which reminded me of the time Siganuk died, and his blood flowed in rivers over the floor. Something seemed to be swelling larger and larger in my head, or was it my heart? Everything I had seen in that house ran through me like a sledge along a wintry street, choking and crushing me. The door opened very slowly, and into the room crept Grandmother. She shut the door with a nudge from her shoulder, leant with her back against it, and stretched out her hands towards the little blue icon, and said in a soft, plaintive, childlike voice, My poor hands, my poor hands, how they hurt.